So May was a cracking month, wasn't it? I'm going to show you my stats in a second, but as a quick reminder, my system is a 6.8 kilowatt peak array split east and west, so 3.4 kilowatts on each side of the house. Uh, we have a um, total of 14.7 kilowatt hours of Give Energy home storage battery, so that's a uh, 5.2 and a 9.5 kilowatt hour battery combined, and those are going into a Gen 2 uh, hybrid 5 kilowatt inverter. Um, so yeah, that's the system. So let me show you the stats. So like many other people, I think May was a very good month for generation. Uh, my total was just shy of 900 kilowatt hours. I had 891.6 kilowatt hours, uh, mostly towards the second half of the uh, of the month, as you can see. So this is the um, the Give Energy web portal, by the way, um, and I'm just showing you uh, the charts that uh, that they display um, to give you an idea of the sort of data you get access to with uh, with the Give Energy system. So this is the generation um, tab, and you can see it gives you the breakdown between um, how much solar went to your home, how much went to your battery, and how much went to the grid and you can see an enormous portion all of the all of this red stuff went to the grid uh, and you can see the best day we had was the may the 20th which was just shy of 40 kilo hours 39.7 kilo hours so on the home consumption tab you can see we use a total of 486.3 kilo hours now that's a combination of our usual daily use which is about six and a bit kilo hours per day um, but it also includes um, our ev which is why there's such a large portion of grid to home because that's all covered um, by charging the car overnight during the cheap octopus flux tariff and the ev amounted to about 115 kilo hours for the month so an average of about 3.7 kilo hours per day although that was um, typically in um, a handful of days rather than spread out uh, across the month um, the a good another good chunk is actually our hot water so we're using the immersion heater on a timer um, also charging up um, that overnight during the cheap octopus flux period and that amounted to um, 136 uh, kilowatt hours so if you take the ev and the hot water away and also the extra that we charged the battery that we then used to um, export back to the grid uh, later in the day during the the, the peak um, period uh, the total uh, home consumption amounted to about 197 kilowatt hours which is an average of 6.4 uh, kilowatt hours so what i'm going to do later is i'm going to show you what it would have cost us on the, um, the standard flexible tariff if we'd used that instead of octopus flux and if we didn't have our solar and battery system to just to give you an idea of how much we've saved this month um, by having the the system and the and the flux tariff uh, compared to um, if we'd just been sort of business as usual just using the standard flexible tariff for our home consumption and the ev but what i'm going to do is i'm going to ignore the hot water because um if we weren't if we didn't have this system, if we weren't on octopus, flu octopus flux, we would have used gas for our hot water, for example. So I'm, I'm going to exclude gas from the uh, from that uh, calculation, and I'm also going to exclude um, any battery that we charged up overnight that we then ultimately um, uh, exported back to the grid. So uh, hopefully I've done that calculation right. I, it all seems to make um, sense based on what we consumed last month as well. So our typical home consumption is pretty consistent from one day to the next. So I'm pretty sure I've done the calculation, calculation correct. Um, but yeah, I'll show you that um, at the end um, in the summary. But for now, let's have a look at a couple of the other tabs you get access to with the uh, the Give Energy system. So if I go up here, um, I can see also what we uh, imported into the battery from both solar and the grid so you can see this um, all of the red stuff here is what we charged up the battery overnight and the rest of it is um, is the solar so you can see it's roughly split half and half which was more or less my intention was to split the charging of the battery roughly half from the grid and half from solar so I've more or less achieved that which was good so the reason I'm doing that is to is to hedge my bets a little bit and rather than fully charge the battery overnight I'm leaving a little bit of capacity so I'm charging up to 80% and then I'm allowing the the excess solar to top the battery up to 100% and then the rest um, obviously then can get exported for the rest of the day so this is me sort of uh, not fully committing to completely charging my battery overnight and not fully committing to completely charging my battery using solar I'm sort of splitting the difference um, so yeah that strategy seems to be working okay uh, I'm maybe I might shift that slightly towards filling the battery a little bit more overnight and discharging a little bit more during the the um the flux peak period to maybe extract a little bit more revenue from that but um yeah that's an experiment that's ongoing during the summer um and you'll learn more about that probably in the the june stats update because i've extended my um uh, discharge period from uh, i've been doing um, an hour roughly an hour during may and i've extended it to about two hours for june so we'll see how how that changes things um in next month's uh, month's stats 
um, but you can see also um, to counter the import the, the battery in we've got the battery out tab and you can see a good chunk of the battery went to the home so um, that's the the green stuff there and then battery to the grid is the red stuff and you can see that's all the stuff that basically we we force exported during that that peak period and just to complete the picture let's have a quick look at the grid in so you can see there grid to home um, a good chunk 232 kilowatt hours and grid to battery 149.9 kilowatt hours and then grid out you can see we exported a huge amount mostly solar 612.8 kilowatt hours but also battery 135.8 kilowatt hours is uh, forcing the battery to discharge during that peak um, octopus flux period so I use the give energy data to estimate things like um, the home consumption and uh, what we used to heat the hot water and all that stuff. Um, but a more accurate way to get the actual measurement of what we imported and exported from the grid is through the octopus data because that uses the actual meter itself. So what I did, I went to the octopus website and I downloaded our half hourly data for the month of May and I've added it all up into half hourly buckets. And what I've got here is um, on this chart, we can see the total energy consumption or export on the left hand side. So here consumption is below the line, uh, negative values and export is above the line, positive values. So this is using the definition that uh, give energy use um, when you look at their, their charts. And on the right, you can see the um, the octopus flux tariff um, in a similar way. The import tariff is below the line, negative values, and above the line is positive values. So here you can see the off-peak period, it looks like the, uh, the, the um, tariff goes up, but actually that's less negative, which means obviously it's a lower price. And so that's us importing during the um, off-peak period at 19.7 pence. Um, and then what happens is uh, this is... Um, the hot water heating up, uh, the EV on charge, and the give energy batteries getting charged up as well. And that charges up to 80% as I was doing um, for most of May. And what happens then is the sun comes up in the morning, tops up the battery to 100%. And once the battery's at 100%, the sun starts um, uh, exporting any excess solar back to the grid. And you can see that that's what happens here. And the last hour of the octopus flux peak period, that's when we were force exporting um, from the battery. So uh, that's that last little peak there. So you can see that's just the pattern that we're, we're doing at the moment. As I said earlier, we for June, I've actually extended this to be two hours instead of one hour. So we'll see how that uh, how that affects the, the stats in June. But I just thought that was an interesting way to visualize the data. And what I'm gonna do, I'm going to show uh, in a future video how I um, download and process the um, the Octopus um, data so, and I'll make um, a sort of template spreadsheet available for anyone who's interested but that'll be a future video um, but for now um, let's go on to the uh, the summary and see how much we saved for the month. Right on to the summary then. So according to Octopus we imported 391.4 kilowatt hours in the month of May and in total that cost us 77 pounds and 25 pence but we also exported 749.3 kilowatt hours, which earned us 195 pounds and 96 pence. So that's pretty impressive. Um, but uh, of course, if we were on the standard flexible tariff for um, both electricity and gas, um, and we didn't have our battery and solar system, we would have not used the immersion heater to heat the hot water, so instead we would have used gas for that. So what I've done is I've uh, extracted that portion of our demand out from the um, from our uh, electrical uh, requirements and uh, converted that into what we would have used for gas using our typical gas use from last month um, and in fact last year as well of about seven kilowatt hours per day. Um, and I've also excluded um, any battery uh, imports that we would then export later in the day. So basically anything that involved the battery system um, that we wouldn't have done if we were on the standard flexible tariff would have amounted to 118 pounds and 17 pence. And the additional gas use for hot water would have amounted to 30 pounds and 74 pence. So if we add those two together and uh, take the difference between that and our bill for the month of May using the octopus flux tariff, then the total savings amounts to 251 pounds and 92 pence. So that's uh, very impressive. I don't suppose we'll be able to achieve that every single month, but maybe during the summer months that uh, that would be a pretty reasonable thing to expect uh, as long as the prices uh, stay approximately where they are. Obviously, um, that's subject to change, um, but I'm pretty pleased with, uh, with that saving for May. Uh, let's see how June pans out. Uh, it started pretty good, and I'll uh, have those stats for you um, on uh, hopefully early July.
And if you're curious how it compares uh, heating our hot water through the immersion heater compared to heating it through gas, uh, well, I can tell you that the cost is approximately the same. In fact, it's, a very, it's been very slightly cheaper heating it with the immersion heater just because of the um, better efficiency um, and the fact that uh, we don't have the standing charge to pay for the gas anymore. So uh, accounting for all of that, um, the difference is only a couple of quid, basically. And in fact, uh, yeah, slightly cheaper with the immersion heater. Um, I'm going to go into a more detailed explanation of all of that sort of stuff in a future video. But uh, for now, um, just assume that um, heating hot water through the immersion heater or gas works out roughly about the same cost. Uh, so with that, I uh, th hope you found that interesting and thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.